All right, we're almost there. It is Wednesday, May the 12th, and this is what we did today. So as a little short discussion, ask the class this question. In your opinion, what is the best way you can prepare to work with a diverse group of people? So what do you think? So if you're working with people from all different countries, different cultures, religions, beliefs, personalities, they look different. How can you prepare to work with those people successfully? Um, number one, I'd probably say just to get to know those people for who they are. Um, number two, when you build relationships with anybody, know that you've got your own set of beliefs and values that are unique to you and know that those other people do too. Um, and be open-minded. So they're not going to think the same way that you do. They're not going to have the same core beliefs that you do. So open your mind, um, be objective, and just understand that everybody's different. And the best way that you can work with people from all over the world is just to get to know them and be open-minded to their opinions. Listen, of course, yes, you can give your opinion, but just remember, don't be judgmental because not everybody is going to believe like you do. And then lastly, number three, um, research. So if you meet somebody that's from a different culture, different religion, um, do some research, ask them questions. <laughs> and this all relates to, you know, getting to know them. So if you're curious about their religion, ask and do some research. Don't assume that they, they do things the way that you do because they don't. Okay, so do research. Then after this, we actually finish up with objective 3.05, which is just being able to communicate not only to customers, but coworkers and employees at your company. So how to adapt your communication style to different cultures and social differences around the world with customers, AKA clients, your employees and your coworkers. All right, so we all have our own cultural lenses. We all see the world through our own eyes, of course. So we just went through and we popped one and we just read some of these scenarios that I had typed out. So we each have our own cultural lenses constructed by us or imposed on us by society and our family and our friends. Most of the time, we are not aware of our lenses at all. <laughs> we don't even think about it, but that's why we're looking at it. We're discussing it. Most important, we forget to recognize that others wear lenses too, and their lenses are going to be different than ours. Businesses employ foreign workers all the time, and they must interact and be productive with sometimes more than a dozen different nationalities. Eye contact, physical distance during interactions, handshakes, and even yes responses are different for every culture. First, you need to be aware of the presence and the impact of those lenses in your, in your attitude and your professional behavior. You need to develop an understanding of your own cultural biases, fears, stereotypes, and how they affect your perception and interactions with others in the workplace. And just recognizing those things is a huge step towards just reducing stress and increasing productivity in the workplace. All right, so some, some facts with um, different cultures in the workplace. So ethnocentrism, we all view our ways of doing things as right. If other people complete a task differently in our minds, they must be doing it wrong. This attitude causes us to set our own set of standards to judge all people. And a lot of times we don't even realize it. It's unconscious. Us as people, we just tend to see their groups and our groups and this is our way of doing it and that's the way it, their way of doing it, but why don't we just come together and create a better way of doing it, increasing morale. And then history and stereotyping. Biases based on some culture, based on historical cultural experiences can explain some attitudes of both employees and employers. Stereotypes arise when people act as if all members of a culture 
or group share the same characteristics, and they do not. Stereotypes give a false understanding of others and allow people to observe, observe others in selective ways that confirm their prejudice. For example, although many Hispanics hold a respect for people in authority and do not hold prolonged eye contact, this is not universally true of all Hispanics. So you can't judge Hispanics for every single person that you come in contact with that you assume is Hispanic. And not all South Americans are Hispanic. So you need to know what you're talking about before you start using one word to generalize an entire population. Just like North America, <laughs> Canada, the United States, Mexico, we're all three totally different countries. And people that would stereotype us as one would be incorrect. So let's take a look at some of those. So generalization, so being general of an entire group of, or an entire culture. And we're gonna look at some specifics. So often a lot of times when we talk about Hispanics, we are referring to Mexico or Mexicans. That is not inclusively true because Hispanic is people from Mexico, Puerto Rico, Cuba, South America, Central America. And the Mexican culture is a lot different from the rest of Latin America. So just keep that in mind when you try to generalize terms. And I'm going to just state that you avoid trying to generalize anything. Find out where each person is from and talk to them about themselves. <laughs> don't generalize anything. And also don't assume. Please don't ever assume anything. Don't look at somebody and assume anything. Have a conversation with them. Get to know them. Be open-minded. Also, the same is true for Asians. Although Asians often are viewed as a homogeneous culture, in reality, the term encompasses people from many different regions, like the Pacific Islands, like Hawaii, Guam, Southeast Asia, including Vietnam, Thailand, Cambodia, Laos, Burma, Philippines, and East Asia, including China, Japan, and Korea. Asians from these countries all have different languages and different cultures. So don't assume just because somebody is from Asia that you can generalize all that you know about quote unquote Asians. <laughs> There's a lot of different countries in Asia. Asia is a huge continent. And then lastly, languages. Languages and literacy are a major problem in communicating with employees from different nationalities. We know this. It is obvious that in most workplaces, places, linguistic assimilation enhances team functioning, effectiveness, and productivity. The lack of clear communication often leads to frustration and stress on individuals and high turnover and profit loss for a company. So guys, please, 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 if you can, you know, I don't care if you are fluent in a second language, but at least learn enough about a second language to make your coworkers feel comfortable with talking to you. Yes, English is the global spoken business language, but you know, now in the United States, Spanish, you know, is huge. So learn a little bit of Spanish to help your coworkers build that relationship with you because it lets them know that you actually care about them and the language that they speak. Now, bridging that culture and communication gap. So businesses can benefit tremendously from language training. You can enhance workplace relationships by learning another language and encouraging foreign workers to learn English and learn how, learn how to pronounce people's names. So this is not Jose, this is Jose, Louis, Embanada, en enunciate, learn how to pronounce people's names. Often foreign names carry specific meanings assigned by their families or cultures. Pronouncing these names correctly shows respect for that person and for the overall culture itself. On the other hand, mispronouncing somebody's name can have a different meaning that hurts the other person's feelings. Most people really appreciate it when you know how to pronounce their name. So understanding cultures. Researching and understanding your own, own culture is, is vital, of course, to your own values and your own beliefs. Um, but what are the underlying social values in the United States? And which value supports the business behaviors that you exhibit in the workplace? 
learn about those values, learn about your own values, and then teach them to your foreign employees. And then also research and familiarize yourself with the other cultures and their history and their values and their beliefs and their behaviors. What are the underlying social values of their cultures and which values support the business behaviors they exhibit in the workplace? Learning the values and your, your other cultures of your coworkers can help you behave in a professional manner. Ask individuals about their traditions and they'll talk to you about them, of course, but build those relationships. So if you're negotiating, remember negotiating a business deal, whether they happen locally or in another country, research before you go into that business meeting. Okay, do some research. A compromise, so just coming to a consensus or give and take with a relationship is the art of dividing the cake in such a way that everybody believes that they get a slice, that they get the biggest piece. It's not easy to reach this goal when both sides share a common culture. It is even more difficult to reach compromise across borders when not only language but also cultural differences can impede communication and understanding. So business deals, even with two Americans, is hard enough. But can you imagine if you, you know, are struggling with a language barrier and some kind of cultural differences? And all of us view the world through our own cultural lens that we construct, that are help constructed by our friends and family and just our society. Sometimes we forget to recognize that we each have a unique lens and that other people view the world through their own different lenses. When people with different cultural backgrounds or nationalities work together. There comes an inevitable moment of misunderstanding, of course, or disappointment during which communication seems difficult. But that lack of knowledge and appreciation of the differences in backgrounds is often frustrating and decreases productivity. So be prepared, do some study. Document. If you come in contact with a business associate from another country through official letters and you plan to meet face to face, bring the entire stack of letters you received. If you communicated via email, bring copies of the email so you can refresh your memory. Also avoid slang and idioms. So don't say stuff like I put all my cards on the table or the ball is in your court. We understand them as Americans, but other cultures do not. So speak clearly with what you want, what you expect, and try to understand what they want and what they expect as well. All right, and the last one, nonverbal signals. So please refrain from these. So like this right here is the middle finger in Brazil it also can mean money. Okay, so just be careful with using hand signals. <laughs> so in Intercultural negotiations, nonverbal signals play a major role, especially when one side is less familiar with the language of the other and is forced to rely even more heavily on nonverbal signals. This is where you need to be very careful because signals are often sometimes ambiguous and not repetitive. While you can ask someone to repeat a sentence that you don't understand, you cannot ask her to repeat a facial expression that you can't catch the meaning of. So in context, your context when you're trying to express yourself to somebody has a lot of meaning. So your tone, your facial expressions, your body language, a whisper. So a whisper to your partner will sound to most Asians like an attempt to conspire a deal. So be careful. Therefore, when they, they, therefore, they will be prepared for a more aggressive defense. Oftentimes, you don't intend for your behavior to send, send a message, but it does. In Japan, you will almost never get an unequivocal no because they consider a no to be a rude response. Hearing a no from you is also considered to be an insult. So just remember that. Where most Americans want to be blunt, and if you don't want to do a business deal, we want you to tell us no. In Japan, that is considered rude. So just keep those things in mind. The last advice I want to give you um, for small businesses that are getting ready for negotiations is to use the services of a cross-cultural consultant or a negotiator. So take a translator with you. If for some reason the company cannot have a consultant at the table, it must at the minimum consult with a consultant on issues related to the cultures of the country on the other side. So if they can't be in the meeting, at least consult with them 
and then get their opinions. Keep the language as simple as you can, even if your counterpart appears to have a good command of the English language. Yeah. So in your exit ticket, go answer those. Um, share three takeaways that you got from today's reading, today's discussion, and I'll see you guys tomorrow.